tuned in to the Creative Ass Podcast. 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 Hey, what's up, everyone? My name is Michael for M3 Creative and the Creative AF Podcast. It's a podcast where we talk about everything indie arts and entertainment. Um, I'm joined with Curtis Wyatt, who is a actor, writer, director, and head of our TV and film for M3 Creative. Our sponsor today is the Atlanta Film Production Group, one of the most active indie film pages on Facebook, so make sure to check them out. Um, today, Curtis, I think I am probably the most excited I've ever been on any episode because of our guest today. I, I, I've, you've been annoying me all morning about this guest today, so I'm happy Probably all funny. week. Yeah. And then I was like, I hope he doesn't cancel. <laughs> it started but, to rain. We're like, oh, Lord, please don't cancel. On this yeah, day. well, you know, there's a lot of people don't like to get out in it. I respect it. Um, but today uh, we have Robert Eager, who is the founder of the Buckhead Film Group. Been in the industry 18 plus years. Oh. Um, there is so many interesting things that I cannot wait to get in and talk to you about. Um, but in 2019, you, you wrote and directed and produced your first feature. I did. Um, one, grateful for being here. Thank you for having me. I know it's been a, we spoke several years ago and um, talked about doing this. I'm glad for it to finally come to fruition. But yeah, my first, um, I guess, uh, uh, exposure to a, a feature, I jumped right in, wrote, directed, and produced, and it was it was a long time coming. It uh, it was a script that I actually carried around for about seventeen years. Wow! Um, so it's like one of those things, seventeen years in the making type yes. deal. I um, had an a, an idea that I put on paper mm -hmm. in two thousand, and. Um, I saw that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, after winning the Oscar for Goodwill Hunting, they wanted to give back to the independent film community, and they founded Project Greenlight, and ended up being a, an HBO series. 1,800 screenplays entered. I made, I think, the top 100. That was amazing. And it gave me enough encouragement and excitement to think that maybe something was there. Now it took and the confidence, on, right? You know, many different. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, versions of that script. But anyway, I carried it around, and then production came to Atlanta, and cost had come down, and I met a group of filmmakers at Georgia Tech at the Atlanta Screenwriters Group, and basically uh, scraped up the money and went into production. It went into production late 2017, actually got released in 2019. But yeah, I jumped, uh, jumped right in, wrote, directed, and produced a shot uh, right outside of Athens, Georgia. So. One of the questions that I have for you, because I've I've made my own film, it's called Swipe Club. It's the very first project that I end up making. But one thing is, is like, what was it about that script? And the film that we're talking about is Full Count. Yes, sir. So what was it about that story that you wanted to tell so bad? Because I know for me, it was my very first one. I was like, okay, if it's going to be something, it's got to be something passionate for me. But what was it for Full Count for you to be like, this is the one I'm going to take a chance of writing, directing, and producing, and putting my full weight behind it? Sure. I think the best way I can answer that is when you carry a couple scripts around for that long, it was something that I thought about every day. That story, that script. Um, and, you know, talking with my wife and my friends that thought, um, I come from a finance background. So when I first um, you know, was, was writing, I was doing it in my own home and I wasn't sharing it with a lot of people because I was a little bit maybe embarrassed of what they would have thought that um, here I was a guy that didn't do well in school, did terrible in English, and who would I really share in my inner circle that I actually had written something because it takes a lot to then put it out there. Yeah. So I think my wife would watch me over the years at night continue to work on this and pick this up and she really came to me and said you're going to have to do this is something that is not going to go away you will have regret if you don't figure out a way to get this film made in the beginning i didn't know what that would look like but i guess the best way i can answer your question is what is it about that first script the first one you decide i would say for most people i hope it's a passion project something that you really have your heart and soul into because it's so difficult to make a feature film mm -hmm. 
It's oh, difficult oh, to make a short in some cases, yeah, so even, let alone a feature. Yeah, yeah. even a short, but it, it it better be something that you really are passionate about and can get behind. And I think that's important. I don't know if that necessarily came across on the screen in the first one because it was such a big feat and I had a bunch of incredible people around me that helped mm -hmm. me do it. But I think that ultimately the one that I decided to go with in the beginning was that one that I just kept coming back to, that story. It's that inner voice kind of calling. And I think most people just know. I think you just know. One thing that uh, out of your answer that I, I think um, is incredibly important and maybe not as given much attention to as it as it should, but the fact that you had your wife in the supporting background, because I think for as a creative, I, I know how important it is that I have that support at home, because if you don't have it at home, it 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 it, it affects you mentally to try to move forward with it, because it's no one's believing in it and no one wants you to do it type I don't thing. think full count comes into existence if his wife is not like baby you need to make well, this I could I could spend our entire time together um, my wife's my biggest fan I this is somewhat of a funny story to me I don't know if it'll it'll come across to a podcast as funny but when I first decided I wanted to make a feature someone gave me some advice it said you know what before you jump into a feature, make a short. And I was like, well, what do I make a short about? Well, they're like, it really doesn't matter, but you're, you're going to write it, you're going to cast it, you're going to direct it, you're going to edit it, and why don't you find out over a six to eight minute short whether or not you even like it before you jump into a feature. So decided to do that many years ago, and we lost a location, and I had to move part of the shoot to our house. And I knew my wife had known that I'd had this stirring and this inner calling to do this. And her, the real reality was she went out and got lunch for the crew. And she came back after they'd set up. And we had cables and camera and people in the house. And I think she walked into the house and she'd been my biggest fan. And she'd been my biggest advocate. And I think it was kind of surreal, but also a little bit... What the hell are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, still, I think she didn't want to show that I think part of her was looking at me like, what the hell are you doing to our house? And then it was a little bit, but, you know, after that, she continued to be my biggest fan. So it's so true what you say, Michael, about having that rock at home because you're going to have so many doubters in the world. Oh, yeah. You're going to have so many naysayers. Imagine if you're getting that at home, too. I, it never yeah. would have been made. You're exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah. You would have been defeat. You would have set yourself up to fail. So let me ask you this: So you have, so you're, you're holding on to this script for 17 years, and at what point? What was the what was the trigger to get the ball rolling to say, you know what, the script is done. I'm going to shoot this. Um, I'm going to shoot it, and start getting the team in production. Like, what is what does all that look like? Oh, wow. Um... I think one of the biggest triggers for me, um, I ended up, you know, you, you carry this around and we're all waiting on funding, we're all waiting on, you know, the stars to align, we're all waiting for the pieces to fall in place. And I think part of that is also maybe excuses and um, there's probably never a right timing. I think for me, I was carrying this around, I had a day job, I had mm -hmm. a full time business that I run. I'm very busy with it. And it's like, am I going to leave my job? Am I going to quit my job? Am I going to take a leave from, you know, how could I go off and mm -hmm. shoot a feature? And I did that year after year. And I would start with New Year's resolutions and then the following calendar year would turn. Something that was a pretty cool, like an aha moment for me. I was, um, I was in church one weekend and our pastor had referenced um, in a series an author by the name of Bronnie Ware. And okay. Bronnie Ware wrote um, a blog that ended up coming into a book, you know, the, and I, I basically think it was The Five Regrets of the Dying. And it really hit me as, as a father of two, approaching my 50s, having two kids that were getting out of college, and just reflecting on my legacy and what I had done. And I was thinking about the sermon, and I was looking at Bronnie Ware, and in a weird chain of events, she ended up at a book signing near me. And I just read it, and it really was written to fathers 
especially fathers with children, and it's a very powerful five-minute read, the blog is. And I don't know why that just stuck with me. And it basically made me think I'm not guaranteed tomorrow, I'm not guaranteed next year. And, and when I'm 60, 70 years old, I'm not going to have the stamina, the drive to go do this. So if not now, and that kind of was an aha moment, and I reached out to a couple producers that I'd met over the years, and I said, I think I've scraped together the money. I don't know what this looks like, but I want to shoot this this year. And I just started meeting, and we got a producer, and we got a director, and we, the, the pieces just started coming together, and we set a date, and we said, we're going to shoot this in August of 2017. And I did enough, told enough people that I set a ball in motion, and it just took off. Well, and the interesting thing that I find in your story, especially with Full Count, is that there's a, it's like you, it was your first, uh, your first at bat, but you, you nailed it, like. Well, thank you. That's... Oh, I like how you use that pun, too. <laughs> ah, <laughs> you see what I did there, right? It was your first, okay. Okay, <laughs> no, enough of the cheesy. Uh, but the the thing I'm saying behind that is like there's there's a lot of people, even people that you know whether they have the funding or got the funding, but the path of a movie, I would say, like uh, for the writer director, th their hero's journey is uh, convoluted sometimes, and they don't necessarily. I think you really handled the business side of it very very well to make sure that your film got the marketing and the exposure and then well, the distribute uh, it's it's truly amazing i remember when the film was released and i was like how is he getting all this pr coverage like because it was something that you didn't see for an indie film that you know with, with unless it would have it, it's an indie film with a really big name attached to it as a as a producer or a list actor or something like that and I was like, man, they're everywhere. Like the the campaign for it, everything just lined up beautifully. How did you how did you orchestrate that? Well, I you know I I got to give credit where credit was due. So I mentioned going to the um, one of the great resources here in Atlanta, the Atlanta Screenwriters Group that meets at Georgia. I think it's now Georgia State. It wasn't Georgia Tech. But when I first had written my first draft of a script. And, you know, I went in and ordered a, you know, a copy of Final Draft, and I tried to format it. But, you know, you don't initially even know what the industry standard format is. And then at some point, you want to have your script read. And I got a line, and I found a screenwriter's group. Well, out of that, I met actors. I met a couple producers. I met the president, Martin Kelly, and he'd made a couple films. And we made a really good relationship. We hit it off, and he had a production company. So ultimately, what I did years later... Um, I reached back out to him, and I think part of, you know, you, you mentioning hitting it out of the park on the first one, that's very kind of you. If if, if you say we did, that's great. I mean, Full but Count I, is on Netflix. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, I, we are very blessed and grateful. Um, I think a lot of that is trying your best to surround yourself with the most talented, hardworking, like-minded people. And... I think one thing that we were fortunate about is, you know, we had, I think, a pretty good script, and I think it it read well, but, you know, we just started trying to plug the pieces in, and I think when you have a good project and you have a really good experience on set, a lot of that ended up, um, you know, I think more organically happened, like you said. No, first time writer, director, producer. A lot of people out of the gate are not even going to look at a project. Right. Um, no real name talent. We were very lucky to have a couple former, very well known, popular Emmy Award winning soap stars. Mm -hmm. But they were, you know, very big, you know, a long time ago and they're moving into acting. So just by taking and piggybacking off of some of the things that they had done and reaching out to their managers and their talent people and the local media. I do think, you know, it was timed a little bit right and we were able to have a nice release um, at Atlantic Station and, you know, having a little bit of the local media behind it was great. But I think a lot of that has to do with a lot of the hard work that, you know, Eddie Singleton and Benny and Martin and Laurent, some of the producers that really, you know, stepped out and went above and beyond. And I, you know, it's that's only possible because of, you know, them and what they did. Because without them, I'm just a guy sitting in a room with a script still. So, it, right. you know, a lot of hard work from a lot of people. So did you go, before you even, when you were in production, did you wait until it was completely 
edited before you decided on what the 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 life cycle of the film was going to be or were you already pre-planning or was it kind of just a step-by-step it was a step-by-step i think we did it you know that was my first film i'm getting ready to go into production on my fourth film in two weeks we'll maybe get to that in a minute um but you don't know what you don't know on your first feature and boy did i not know a lot and i still am learning and growing what I ended up finding out at a later date is most filmmakers, most directors, producers do not finish a film and then figure out distribution. Distribution is actually figured out and coordinated in advance. Well, I didn't even know how to make a film. Let alone tackle <laughs> distribution. Yeah. So you're correct. I ended up with a film with the, with you know 18 hours of footage and. We're going to, you know, go through post. I didn't know what that looked like. And then maybe I'm going to try to get this film out there. So um, it was a step-by-step. I I learned a lot. I didn't do it in the right order. Grateful for where we ended up on Netflix. Um, Oh, we're going to talk about that. (laughs) That's rare. Um, But, yeah, definitely winged it and figured it out. But definitely would not be the way that I would make a film now, um, knowing what I It's do. crazy. It's crazy to me because the thing is, I also think it's a great part of filmmaking is you're just doing it straight out of passion. It was the naive of not knowing, but it's like, you know what? I have a passion to do this. I've collected the money. I have the finances to go in and to do that. Actually, for the finance, were you able to actually get the Georgia tax credit? We were. So we did qualify after everything was done. We just got over the 500000 spend. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we were fortunate enough that we were able to qualify. If so what is oh, – yeah, I was ahead. about to say, if you don't mind just breaking it down, because I know that a lot of indie filmmakers, like, don't really know how the credit works or exactly how much you have or, to actually – Or what you have to do to qualify. qualify like, what are some sure. of the main um, factors? Now, I will say this is 2017. Mm-hmm. Now, in the event that the minimums or maximum have changed – Everyone fact check me here because my my last couple projects we did not shoot in Georgia, hmm. um, not a um, anything. It just ended up being the. No, you just killed me right now. But it's, okay. <laughs> it's all good. Um, uh, we are coming back to Georgia though, so um, that's awesome. But uh, so 2017, the the spend you had to have a qualifying qualifying spend, and this is very important and a great question. I thought initially we applied up front, we got all of our contracts together worked with the, uh, with, with, with the state and got our certificate of approval. And if you don't know, um, they will break down everything from your spend from hotel, costume, payroll, meals, and not everything. Just because you wrote a check for it and just because you spent a dollar on it in Georgia doesn't mean it's a qualifying expense. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you like one example that comes to mind. I thought our rap party, or the rap production, I thought maybe when we had a little bit of a premiere, we spent money on a theater and a red carpet and hired photographers. A lot of that doesn't qualify. So we were very fortunate that we made it over. Uh, one of the things that we did, one of our producers really wanted to do our color in LA. That was a big number that almost, when we had to back that out because we went to L.A. for color, that travel, that air, that hotel, that color that we hired, that company. Not qualifying. Doesn't qualify. So we really were at the end, you know, pinching pennies to make sure we hit it. So, you know, that's correct. It was 500000 If you do have a qualifying spend, it's a 30% tax rebate. Um so what exactly does that mean? Like, so you qualify, so are you getting money back or is it just mo- less money um, coming out of your pocket? It, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, depending on how the investment came in, um, and I don't want to turn this into a, a tax class because one, I wouldn't be qualified to do it, but what will end up happening, if you raise capital, you have an outside source that funds and puts money into the production. Mm-hmm. Technically, if you negotiate it that way, that investor, him or her, that entity, should negotiate that I put the capital up, I took the risk. If this goes poorly, at minimum, I want the tax rebate or credit. Now, again, it's negotiable. So technically, if you're self-funding or doing it, you could also use that credit 
towards future tax liability. So there really is a couple different ways to lower your tax liability as an entrepreneur, um, depending on your tax bracket. You can also, a third way, you can sell tax credits. So um, people that have nothing to do with the film industry, high net worth earners that want to have a tax break, I want to write off a second home, I want to write off stock losses, I want to, you can buy and exchange tax credits. So a lot of what people do is the bigger productions, and like I said, I'm, I'm not even qualified to talk up, you know, about this, but the bigger studios that come here, I'll give an example. You could have someone like the Fast and Furious come spend $40 million that qualifies in Georgia, set up a studio production, spend $40 million here. 30% of that is 12 you literally could take a tax credit like that and that studio could almost finance an another entire film. So they may choose internally to keep that and parlay that into a future spend, but you can trade them, you can exchange them, it could go to the investor. Um, depending on how you raise your capital, you can sell them. So there's a lot of different things that you can do on tax credits. So with <clears throat> so in in your journey with full count, when did you start tackling and going down the, the, the lane of trying to figure out how this tax credit thing works and everything that you had to learn to know how to <laughs> qualify and go through all those things because I'm sure there's like, okay, where do I start? I went to there because first of all, I knew that it'd be a big part of our budget and a big part of our finance plan, the tax credits. You know, on a $500,000 film, you know, it's a good $150,000 that's coming back to someone. So if I wanted to talk to someone about investing and they were looking at their risk, you have to raise X. And we know this is just a very highly speculative industry. And you're a first-time writer, director, and producer. Mm -hmm. You're a mortgage guy. You don't know anything about filmmaking. So if I was going to ever entice someone to consider investing, I knew that I had to have that up front to look at where we hope to finish. So I immediately went out to their website. Um, there's so many productions being done here that they've set up a website of tools for the independent filmmaker, for the big production companies, and you literally go down a checklist. So when did I start? I did start up front and they do ask you to apply. Mm -hmm. They're going to make you go through a screening process, script, when do you plan on shooting, what is your budget, do you have the money, and you end up with a tax certificate. And that comes from the state of Georgia and it says if you make X and you deliver Y, you will qualify for this. But remember, they're going to audit you. So just because you say that I'm going to spend a million dollars, you don't know that someone may even spend a million dollars, but are they going to spend it in Georgia? And will it be a quality Can you expense? prove it? So mm -hmm. it's part one is upfront applying, getting that certificate, getting the state to approve it, then watching your budget throughout production, looking at your spend, making sure that you're spending it on the right things, and then upon delivery, they're going to ask for a copy of the film, and then you're going to get something I never knew what a comfort letter was. Comfort letter sounds like a letter that may comfort someone. It brought me no comfort at all because we realized that we were on the threshold. But you end up getting an independent auditor who will go in and um, will, uh, you know, verify your spend. Sounds so like an uncomfortable letter. <laughs> so it's beginning and the end. Okay. Well, one thing, because you just mentioned the website, if you don't mind, what is the website that you went to? You caught me right off guard. Um, we'll get it. We'll put it in the, the, the description it in, in the yeah, show notes. So. We'll definitely get it. Um, it's end of every film that they film here in the little peach logo. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That you see on there, but yeah, we'll get that in. So is, is 500 thousand the bare minimum to be eligible for a tax credit that was 2018 that's what it was the last few years but it was you had to have a qualifying spend now that was for a feature film there are some other things for short tv and other forms of media that was for a feature length film at the time we went into production correct? gotcha at any <clears throat> excuse me at any time when you first saw that number were you kind of like, hmm, is this something I really want to, because I mean, that's, especially, was it, did you raise the funding? Did you fund it yourself? And what was the, 
uh, the thought process of moving forward once you saw it, like, oh, maybe we could just do the feature and not, not be eligible because I could get it done for a lot cheaper versus? Yeah, so we could probably spend a whole, we could probably come back and do a whole podcast on funding. And I know there's probably a lot of people listening, and, and I get it because I went through it too. You know, you first start with the script, Mm -hmm. And if it goes far enough along, you get into a budget. And depending on the type of uh, film you're making, uh, you know, a drama, you know, a period piece, um, sci-fi, those can be big numbers. So when we we talk about budget, I knew as a starter that I was likely not going to be able to raise big money because, and I, I wouldn't blame someone for investing in a film that I, you know, felt like, you're a mortgage guy. You know nothing about the film industry, and you want me to do what? So I knew there were going to be some challenges with raising capital, and I get that asked all the time. People tell me all the time the only thing holding them back is funding. And I had people say this to me that I looked up to in the industry, and a lot of people told me that when I got to the right time and place, and I got far enough along, that funding will not be in your top five challenges. And I said, no, no, but you don't know me. You don't know my financial situation. The only thing Mm -hmm. holding me back is the financing. And that's really what I believe because I wasn't sure where I would get it from. I felt like access to funding was going to be the only thing that kept me from making my feature. Mm -hmm. And I would meet people and different people had ideas for script and I, I would run into them and how you doing on your script and they still wouldn't have finished it. There's a lot of people that couldn't even get past the beginning. And I think if you get all the way to that process where you know that you're going to make it and it comes to a point where you're really left to, I'm at a point where I've got to get the funding. I believe we live in the greatest country on earth and there is money falling off the trees in our country. And I know everyone doesn't have access to it, and I know it's not everywhere, but I promise you, when you get to the point, if you have a business plan and a script and you have got everything together, Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to raise millions of dollars, but I believe that that is a reasonable amount of money. So I did kick in a little bit. I did have some buddies that just looked at me and said, there's got to be something there. You've been carrying this around for 15 years. I see how hard you're working on it. I'm willing to invest in you. I believe in you. And I was actually able to. I thought I was going to have to get four or five people to kick in $100,000. I raised the money from fewer people. A a, a lot of people asked me to budget 90 days for the capital raise. I raised it in less than a week and ended up with more money than I needed. And I don't want to say that because I know there's probably a lot of people that are like, I've asked. But I really believe don't let funding hold you back. Work on your script. Get a great script. Get your business plan together. I do believe that the money, that you can get the money. Anyone can get the money. That's really interesting. Let me ask you, what is it um, for people? Because we do like we, we have a wide range of audience of very beginner filmmakers and then, you know, very uh, polished uh, veteran filmmakers. What does a business plan for a film what are some of the, the main factors that someone needs to put together as they're developing their script? So when they do want to approach somebody, uh, it it's does it looks professional. You know what I mean? Because sure. like sometimes like oh I have this idea and we're like okay well let me see the what's your plan? You know what I mean? Every production's different. Every contract's going to be different. But if I just had to simplify it, industry standards, looking for an investor to invest capital, usually what a contract would look like on an independent film. Uh, there's something called lean position. So whenever you invest, you will come in in a position. And in order to strengthen your position of investment, you want to be in first lean position. That means you're first to get paid. You don't want to be in fourth or fifth lean position because that means everyone gets paid before you. So lean position is important, but generally it looks something like this. I invest X. I'm going to give you $100,000. I want to be paid first. I get to recoup my investment plus 15%, and then I'm going to get a cut of the project. That would probably be, if I had to you know, simplify it into a sentence or two, your investment back plus about 15% plus a percentage of the, call it 
net profits or the profits of the film after all the other investments have recouped. Where it gets challenging is if you work an agreement out with your investors, so let's say you raise $500,000 to make a film and you get everything structured, but you don't have distribution in place, your distributor upon delivery of the film is going to try to jump all the other investors. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I could spend a lot of time on it, but basically what that That's really interesting is, to know though. <laughs> yeah, they, they um, basically what a distributor says is this, and this is what happened with Full Count. You're delivering me a film that we like. Um, I was told that it was a baseball film and that baseball is an American pastime. It does not travel well internationally. It will never go beyond the United States. I was also told that it had a faith element to it. So I was told out of the gate by multiple distributors, unless it was a distributor buying faith-based type content, I was told that my audience was so limited that there would be no upfront money guarantee. We're going to take a gamble on your project. We'll distribute it for you. We don't know how it's going to do, but we're going to spend 60, 80, 100 grand to market it. We want to recoup our money and we want to be repaid and we're going to make DVDs and we may have to have DVDs returned and we're going to make a poster and we're going to make a trailer. So here we were with a completed film. Investors had put money into it and they wanted to know when they're going to get their money back. And this distributor that we needed a distributor, we needed a sales agent, they said, well, wait a minute. I understand your investors are owed money. I understand you raise money, but in order for me to take this film and put it on my platform, I'm going to have a spend. And I want to be repaid on my money before I start repaying. So a lot of the investors and the people that put in almost moved down a little bit in lean position because you can't get your, you could self-distribute. That obviously is an option. I didn't know how to do it, didn't want to do it, didn't have the time to do it, and I felt like a sales agent would be our best way to get our film out there, but the other side of that was they're going to come in with a contract and say, you're not going to start being able to recoup until we've recouped our investments, so you mm. have your production budget. Well, now I've delivered it and I went to a distributor. They had costs, so it's almost like their cost superseded and went in front of my investors so definitely can be challenging but the good and they use that weight because that th your film does nothing without them that's correct and like i said i am grateful for vertical they've done everything that they've asked out of the gate on netflix two-year agreement united states and canada i got a sales agent internationally We've sold 13 territories. We're in South Africa. We're in Sweden. We're in France. We're in Germany. So ultimately, it has worked out, and the checks are coming in, and we're not quite whole after two years, but it's been very promising and a very good experience. But if you had told me when I went into production how I thought this was going to play out <laughs> and how this I ended up here, it would so it, you know it equipped me for project number two i was a little bit more wiser and then project number three and then you know just to answer your question you know about what does it look like for an investor well now that i'm going into my fourth film um it's in pre-production it goes into production in two weeks we're actually shooting in tijuana mexico that's titled awesome. black warrant um we know a lot more now so you know, I probably can't share too much about it, but what I can tell you is this. I mentioned figuring out your distribution before you go into production. This is already with Paramount. And I probably can't get too into details, but here we are having raised the money. We're about to go into production. I already know where this is going. Paramount is just dying for content right now. Interesting. They have already... Well, they started their own streaming service. Terms yeah. carefully, but we already know where that's going, and you can leverage that as part of your financing plan. And maybe what we'll do when that gets into post, I'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Oh, yeah, it. definitely. I known what I knew now on film four, mm -hmm. on how it's raised, where you get it, how you leverage it, how you don't put your own money into it, how you use their money, leverage their tax credits, and finance it, and then know who's going to get it delivered to. It's almost like it took me four films to figure out what the secret sauce is. And I don't know that I have it completely figured out, but this has been a much better experience. Well, yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest parts is 
it's sad to say, but until you get your feet in the mud, you really don't know what you're doing, especially when it comes to filmmaking, whether it's making a short, making a feature. And what makes me laugh is when you were even talking about it right now, it looked like a huge weight was just lifted off your shoulders because you were like, I know exactly where it's going. So oh. how did the how did the relationship with Vertical, how did that, how did, because um, Vertical, it, well, they're like, they're not in Georgia, right? They're, they base, so what you do if you're, well, I shouldn't say what you do. What we did on full count, you now have a completed, call it, you know, a, you know, a final, I don't want to say it's a um, locked picture, but you have a pretty good proof of concept. And mm -hmm. a lot of uh, smaller mini distributors really are wanting content. And they have screeners, and they will give you the ability to submit films to their platform. And I assume that what they do is just, I don't know if they're interns, or, but they're constantly kind of looking and watching movies, and you kind of either get a call back or a pass. So what we really did is we identified about 12 to 15 what we thought were family-friendly, faith-based providers that we thought would have an appetite for this film, that it would mm -hmm. fit their library. And we submitted it to, a, let's call it 15. I was Initially, when you get 12 people saying that they want it, your, your eyes get really big and you feel like you have something. And you're encouraged because you maybe got two or three passes, but you're like, well, we have 12 people that want it. Well, what you don't know is they really want it for their library. Doesn't mean they're going to give you anything for it up front, but they want it for their library so they can monetize it over a few year period and then give you a little bit of a cut. So then it was digging down into those 12 distributors that wanted it. Who was a good partner? Where could you get this film on? What did the contract look like? So it really was a process of elimination, you know, going down that list. And then what we would do is, I, you know, I'm not saying that this is a profound statement or anyone else would not think of this or it's not done. Having a business background, when we narrowed it down, I went and found filmmakers that had a film in their library and I stalked them on social media. And I said, I'm an up and coming first time writer, director, filmmaker. I'm talking to Vertical. I see that you have a film on their library. It's been there a year and a half. Are you happy? Did you get paid on time? Did they put it on the platforms they said? And overwhelmingly, the response was positive. So I wanted to know that if I was signing this over for an extended period of time, you know, it's hard to get a look into these companies' financials other than what they just have on the Internet. So right. I just thought I'd go to people that had business relationships and almost ask for a referral. Are you happy? So once I narrowed that down, Vertical's out of L.A. They actually have probably over 100 films in their library, and they're a pretty reputable company, and they're partnered with everyone from Netflix to Amazon to Apple with Hulu, all the big streamers, but their little niches, they don't do a lot of theatrical, but they, um, I was very kind of happy to see my film in a, with a company with a slate of other films that had large A-list actors, and they told me up front, we're taking a gamble on this, it's got a faith element, it's baseball. You're a first-time writer, director. It's an independent film. It's a little bit flawed. It's got, you know, some sound issues and this, that, and the other. But we want to put it on our library, but there's no data to share how this is going to do. If it was horror, if it was comedy, if it was drama, I could take other films in our library and say, we expect that you'll recoup in two years, three. You know, they had all that data. Mm -hmm. But for a couple family-type films, the data wasn't there, and it was a little bit of a leap of faith. But I'm just, I've been really been happy with them. One last thing on that is our Netflix deal is two years. It expires in February, so we did a two-year U.S. and Canada. They. I've heard that they've asked to extend it. I don't know what the terms are, but I'm real excited to see what this may look like outside of that. It's been probably the largest well-known platform that has got me so much exposure. But Netflix did not take it um, for I mean, two years is a long time, but not a long time. So we'll see what happens. So that's another thing for the people that are listening. Sometimes when you sign over rights to a streaming platform, mm -hmm. you want to know what you're being compensated, but what is the term? So in this particular case, they took full count for two years. Well, the, the, the interesting thing, too, that I really wanted to 
dive into and talk about with Netflix, I think um, for filmmakers, getting a film or a series on Netflix is like the holy grail, right? But at the same time, one of the, the big things that people don't realize is being on being in the Netflix library and being a, a, a Netflix film is two different things, right? Like it's two Absolutely. different exposures for a project. So I, I think with your film is still it's still your film. It's just in their library, but they're not necessarily doing anything to actively push your film unless someone is searching for a particular thing for it to populate. Is that that's what if an accurate I think you used a couple key words there that are great, which Netflix is, uh, there, there's a lot of competition now, but it is the holy grail. So I will say this, when Vertical approached us and said, it's not a ton of money, but the exposure of just getting on Netflix can set you up for more international, which mm. it did. So think about this. I've got a film that they told me out of the gate that's flawed, it's independent, you don't have any A-listers, um, you're a first-time writer, director, producer, um, we've already told you that it's a baseball theme and a faith-based theme, so it's not going to travel well internationally. Mm -hmm. When it got on Netflix, people internationally automatically, regardless of the content, are like, that's a film I didn't look at, but oh wait, I'm sorry, did you say it's on Netflix, United States, and Canada? It brought a little bit of credibility to the film that they just Absolutely. assumed because it was on Netflix that they may want to take a look at it. Now, you are correct about Netflix will finance and, and own and create their own content. They'll acquire films. This is one thing that I would say for all filmmakers. <coughs> Either they got a pass from Netflix or has a film on Netflix and Full Count is no award-winning Oscar film. I don't take lightly that we're on it, but I think the reality of it is this. Timing is everything. Don't get discouraged. Netflix comes in and out of the market. They will look at their um, database. And you mentioned maybe they have their own content, but sometimes they have content that they take for extended period of times, and that content falls out of their library. They may need comedy. The next month they may need horror. Mm -hmm. the next, so I also think, too, when we look at the film and people say your film's on Netflix, was it deserving to be on it? I don't know. That's but subjective, I do, though. That's well, I mean, yeah. yeah. I think that what I heard was there was a little bit of a demand for a little bit more family-friendly type films, and it was there. So a lot of it ended up being timing, knowing a little bit about, and sometimes it's so hard to know what a distributor may be buying. I've seen great films get a pass, and someone tell a filmmaker, right now we don't want horror, but finding out six months later, they went in and acquired more horror, and it may not be because they passed on that film. It may just be simply because they, they're looking for a different genre for their library at that right. time. So, But anyway, I'm very grateful that it's on it. It has opened us up to a lot of different opportunities as a filmmaker and distribution, so very grateful. How much of that is do you feel is based on the relationship Vertical had with the people at Netflix? Because, I mean, I think getting on their radar or getting their attention uh, in any form is probably a, a daunting and difficult task, especially when, you know, it, it's a first time everything. Like, they're kind of like, eh. But it's got to be the relationship with Vertical, right? 100%, and I, they do have that. And that's what I, I'm... Like I said, I have a great relationship with Vertical. They've done everything that we have asked, um, possibly may have another film we're doing with them. So I don't have anything negative to say about them. The industry as a whole, the sales agent distribution piece, um, and I think a lot of it comes out of my ignorance and not understanding it. Um, it's very hard to get access to their data. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit earlier about sometimes people sharing ideas and sharing wisdom. Netflix will sh share subscribers because they have to do that for their investors. Netflix will not share views. Remember, Netflix is an SVOD. It's a subscription mm -hmm. VOD. You pay 19 bucks a month and you can watch as much content as you want. Therefore, when they acquire a film, they're going to give you a flat fee 
for a period. We're going to give you X for two years. Now, if one person watches it or one million watch it, your you're fee is still going to get paid, but you're not going to get paid any more mm -hmm. if that's Netflix. That's their model. It's a subscri subscription VOD and SVOD. Vertical having the relationships with a bunch of different people, you cannot get in those meetings and in those contexts. So I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say that I wanted to navigate that in the beginning, but I didn't know why I couldn't go talk to those people. But they will like you needed like an aggregator, right? Like you had to have the middle. You have to go through them. And I guess now that they're providing a value for that, it's important. But of all the horror stories I hear from filmmakers, more and more I hear about distribution. A distributor went bankrupt. A distributor never sent me a statement. I never got paid. They took my... F so I don't know. I'm, I just have a really... <laughs> hard time and a, and a passion point for up-and-coming filmmakers, myself s still included, is how do we navigate the transparency of sales agents, financing, and distribution because no one talks about it. We're creative artistic people with an idea and we go make a completed film and then often the investors can just get screwed. A lot of the promises that we made to investors up front, how they're going to get paid, that goes out the window when a distributor gets involved. So as you can tell, it's kind of a hot button for me. But, um, no, I think it's good, though. I think it's, it's, it's information that people need to know as well because I think it's... <sighs> It's so convoluted once the film is made and there's so much because, too, we're not even talking about, you know, especially on, you know, your bigger when, when you start having films with A-list people and they're getting residuals on back end and how different those contracts and all that stuff can get really mucky really quick. So yeah. um, I can just imagine, you know, just even on, on the indie side of doing your first feature and having to still go through all those waters so was it so the film was done and then you had the meeting with vertical correct but typically what you're saying is you would want to align distribution before even making the film well right I'm, i mean just from what you're saying it seems like it'd be easier for you in terms of talking to investors and talking to people if you had the distribution aligned first and making those meetings and talking to those people right and you know the, the word independent filmmaker I, I know is loosely used it's subjective i think when we talk about first-time filmmakers if you really are trying to do something you know, just to get something made i'm, I'm a very big believer in encouraging in that if you know what the media the medium and what you hope to do with that. When we talk about independent, let's call it outside of the studio, how 90% of the films are made. Now, you've got your big studios that are making these blockbusters and tentpole, you know, the Marvel and those, all that aside, but the average film, generally how it is made is this. No one, no studio, no individual, no production company wants 100% risk of a film. Everyone that I trust and know and I value their input, every studio head I've talked to, every lead actor will tell you, no one knows anything. If anyone tells you out of the gate they've got a hit script that they know is going to win an Oscar or make millions of dollars, just look, no one knows. I've seen the best scripts that have turned into flops. I've seen scripts that were passed over, that were told they're terrible, make tons of money. No one knows anything. So once you know that and you're going to uh, head your position and look at raising money, the average studio production company will say this, okay, are we going to go to a state that has tax credits? 30% of your budget could be a big number out of the gate just by going to a state that is going to pay you to shoot there. Mm -hmm. So think about what you've already done for the investor and other people. We've already got a third of the project covered. What they generally will do is go after an A-lister. In our fourth film, not probably at liberty to discuss it, we have an A-lister for our fourth film that I'm doing. Um, what you do is you package that up with the script and you put their name on it with their letter. A letter, like a letter of intent or a commitment letter. We have it. And you go out, and then what happens is the studios and the international territories that need content will prepay you for a territory or for the film. So how it looks like is this. Let's just stick with a million bucks. A million bucks, okay, how am I going to come up with a million? 
Well, the tax credits could very easily give you 250 to 300 And keep in mind, you can sell those or you can even go to a bank in advance. So a lot of people think, well, wait a minute, I've got to be finished and wrap production and deliver it and then I get my check. No. Banks will take a little bit of a scrape, but with the right director, with the right cast, you can finance tax credits. So for example, million dollar budget, you could get, you're not going to give you 300, but let's say 250. They will give you that as working capital for your budget if you finance it with the right packaging. So up front you need a million bucks. You get 250 if you finance your tax credits. That's a very big thing in Hollywood. If you have a name actor, you will get six to eight hundred thousand dollars of pre-sales will come in and say that script with that director, with that actor, I'll give you and France gives eighty and Germany gives sixty. And so then you've got seven to eight hundred thousand dollars of capital that has come from the sales agents the pre that pre-sold their territory. You take the tax credits. So most of these studios will go into a production with maybe 10 to 15 percent. We call that equity. Some of them like to use 25 percent, but most of the films being made today, 25 percent is cash. 75 percent is raised through various means. And that's how they're being able to come to the table. And they've got it figured out, and a lot of it is about delivery, but regardless of how well the film does, it's pre-sold, the tax credits are done, you've minimized the risk to the studio and the investor, and they're off to make film number two. Wow. That's I, mind blowing. Yeah, that's what well, the knowledge that you are dropping on this podcast. <laughs> it, it, nobody's I'm, ever heard I'm this still stuff. Still learning before. and growing, and like I said, it took me four films and a lot of hours and a lot of time and a lot of money to get here. And I'm still like I said, Can you give us an aroundabout just so people have a, a, a an idea that hey, it's it's there is you're gonna spend money to to get into this and you're there are gonna be certain investments from from your perspective if you're really going to take it on do you have a uh an around just a a very vague or number uh, on the low end it's so that's so hard I, you know i say this and this is a a, a very cheesy cliche answer anything that you get into that you're passionate about a lot of the investment is time Oh, yeah. You're going to, you know, th there were times, like I said, I am a very active social person. Mm -hmm. I've got my bros. I'm on tennis teams. I'm in fantasy football. I mean, I, I run around, and my wife is so grateful that the people that I, I mean, I am busy like everyone is. Mm -hmm. But what you'll realize, if you're passionate about starting something, it's going to cost you something. Yep. And you're going to have to have Friday nights where you stay in. Because you're gonna run that you're you're gonna have Saturdays. Last weekend, I went to go support a local filmmaker. I had something cool that I wanted to go do, but I needed to be at this premiere. It was in the middle of the day in a very low budget film, but I needed to go do that. And it was an hour to get there and two hours to do it. But in that particular thing, it didn't other than a tank of gas. But those are the things that you're investing in a career, building relationships mm -hmm. in, in any industry you do, and that could be film, that could be anything. But you know what? It's so hard to say, put a dollar amount on if you were to go get in the film industry. Really what it's doing is finding one film that you're passionate about, getting a great group of people together, and finding out what your risk is, your risk or another person's risk, for doing what you're passionate about. Right. I knew, I knew that I would not be content doing something that was not this wasn't something i just decided to do overnight it's 17 years right and it was going to cost me something every day i didn't make that film because it was gnawing at me so ultimately i was prepared to lose a lot of money to put this thing to bed i had to go do this and my mm -hmm. wife knew it what so something i've noticed um now Robert is just an executive producer on the, these last couple. Pr there, yeah, there's not written by us. or director. Yeah. It's it's. Tell me about that transition of just going into it. Is that what you're wanting to do now? Is just be an EP on projects you don't want to. You know, directing is hands on. Very every right. detail of through that process. Is there is there a reason you went just to the EP versus director to EP? To me, those are two totally drastically different worlds to me. They are. So the first one, wrote, direct, and produced. The 
The other two features that are completed and currently streaming, I was executive producer only on both. Mm -hmm. And this fourth one that's going into production in two weeks, I'm strictly executive producer. So yes, I left the directing chair, the writing chair. I think a lot of it was this. I knew how hard it was. I knew how much more I had to learn. I had to grow as a filmmaker. It, it was one of the biggest things that I tackled. I learned so much. Will I go back and do it? Yes, I do have a couple, but I really felt like what I was going to do is drop back and learn more about the business. Before I got into another one of my passion projects and decided to write or direct, how could I just dive deep into the industry and learn everything I could about contracts and distribution? So yes, I did a pivot. The last three I've been serving as executive producer, I'm enjoying it. I'm growing, um, you know, just to maybe give you a couple cool little stories. So film number two um, initially uh, came out titled Reckoning. Um, I left production on full count. Our lead actor, Adam Boyer, was cast in a film um, written and directed by a, a very um, well-known husband writing, husband writing and directing team that was here in Atlanta. They've recently moved to LA. Lane and Ruckus Sky have been in the independent film community for a decade and they are just so well respected. They're really known as writers. They have written a lot of scripts. They are full-time writers. They are being paid in an industry that is so competitive. Um, they wanted to direct, and I think this is something that we'll talk about so it'll be pretty cool for people on your podcast here. Every time they put into direct, every studio, every agent, every manager said, but you're writers. What have you done? No one is going to let you direct a feature film. You're writers. And they went out and made a couple shorts, and they won some awards, and they tried to show that reel. Look, but we can direct. Here's a short. And they're like, no one is giving you a million or two, two million dollars to direct it. What is, where's your reel? What's on your resume? You're writers. And it was very discouraging for them, and they finally wrote an independent film titled, initially titled Reckoning, and they got their actors together, and they, they cast it, <clears throat> and they knew so many people that had told them over the years, when you get ready to direct a feature, you call me. They had so many favors that they had built up over the years, and when they went and called, these people said, I will, if, unless I've got a commitment to another project, I will come to the North Georgia Mountains for three weeks to be with you. I believe in you, Lane and Ruckus, so much. Whatever you're doing, I'm all in. So I wrapped up full count. We were barely into editing. Adam Boyer, our lead actor, uh, played a David in full count. was talking to Martin and said they were scraping up a little bit of money. They lost funding. And we came a little bit under budget, and um, I got to talking to Martin, and I at that point had such a passion for the filmmakers because I felt like regardless of what happened to Full Count, regardless of where it went, I was able to check a box and do something that I've met people for 15 years that are trying to get a feature made that haven't. And what was it about me that was so special that I was able to come into this industry with a few years' experience and get it done, and I wanted to give back. So anyway, I met them went into production with them. It was titled Reckoning. It went all the way through. Great projects. Got a lead actress by the name of Daniel Deadweiler who has now gone on and is a Netflix series and an Amazon series. But we got into distribution. The distributor acquired it and Netflix released a series called Reckoning. So the distributor did a name change called Devil to Pay. So that was an independent film. It's out now on Amazon. It won multiple awards on the festival circuit. But I was executive producer, and that kind of lit my fire for almost investing in local Atlanta filmmakers mm. that had a very good script and were very creative and talented, but did not understand the business side and how right. to get access to capital. So I then parlayed that into a third project called, actually that one ended up all the way through um, uh, post title Blindsided. Paramount picked that up and acquired it, and they titled that Night of the Sicario. Okay. That's now on Paramount. So it's very fortunate that learning through those and about to go on this fourth one, but right now what I've been trying to do is help up and coming, really because I'm in Atlanta, Atlanta filmmakers that may have a script, that may not know anything about budgeting, that may not know anything about distribution, and just saying, hey, what would this look like? So it's almost been a passion of mine to get into EP um, and hopefully not lose my shirt while I'm doing it. Can you, can you, t 
can you talk a little bit about what an EP does? Obviously, they they they're, they either a, a big piece of it is finding the finance or or getting the finance of some type of way. But what it are you um, are you maintaining any type of creative control? Like, what are some of the other things outside of the, the the money piece that your role as an EP in these projects have have been? Good question. Great question. I'll talk about it on the independent side because obviously the bigger studios that have full time um, multiple and they're in charge of acquisition. They on, on a big studio, the executive producers do perform a different role. So let's talk on the independent side. Big part of it is raising capital negotiating contracts. Um, the question, do you get involved on the creative side? You really try not to, but the, the hardest thing about this business, I think, for really up-and-coming writers and filmmakers, and I'm going to, I've said this before in some interviews, it's come across the wrong way, I've worded it poorly, <laughs> And it, well, I'm excited to see what comes all, out now. It's all because of... <laughs> no pressure. And I think mo I, hopefully I can land the plane here and people will know where I'm going, but it always comes out wrong. Because who am I to speak because I've made a couple films and they've been on great platforms. What do I know? Not a lot. But from my wisdom, what I because I come from a business background, most of the people that I meet in this industry are creative and artistic. Mm -hmm. I am not. That's not... I, I, I really am not. You may say, well, you did write and direct and produce a film that's on Netflix. Okay, thank you. I, I did write one, but maybe I got lucky. But I don't consider myself artistic and creative. I know a lot of artistic and creative people. Most of those people that I know really well that are artistic and creative, they're not good with business. And I mean <laughs> that politely. I don't mean that no, to be negatively. It's, we all it's need facts. to serve in areas where yeah. we're gifted. And I don't know that I'm gifted in the area, but that's my background. I've started companies. I've sold companies. I have companies with 60, 70 employees. So that's my background. I know what a P&L is. I know how to do payroll. I know how to dig into a budget. So what helped on full count, I didn't have the creative and the artistic ability, but what worked out well, like, I mean, I, I tell my kids all the time, I laugh, I can't work my camera on my iPhone. <laughs> but I've written and directed a feature film, and I, I did do that, but yeah. I hired great people. I can't work the phone on my camera. Um, but I was able to write, direct, and finish and produce and deliver a feature film. And a lot of that came from the business background. We finished on budget. We didn't run over. Again, we, we had a lot of failures. A lot of things went wrong on it. But what I did bring to the table was I had that other side that a lot of creative and artistic people get into this industry, and it's their craft. They specialize in a particular area this, in this industry. It could be wardrobe, it could be camera, electrical. But a lot of them are driven to the entertainment industry and a lot of them have a script. They don't know what to do with it. A lot of these people, because they're independent contractors being paid $10.99, their income isn't even consistent. They can't balance their checkbook, much less a budget. And I don't mean that to be mm -hmm. negative. It should be encouraging for them to partner with someone that is really going to look out for and help the independent filmmaker. So all I would just say on that is what I really do on that is, you know, look at the money, share a business plan, really go over the risk, creative. It is a business. We have to sell it. So if someone comes to you with their passion project, sometimes we have to make compromises and you want to try to do that up front. They're set on an actor, an actress, a scene, a location. It may not be in it. And the compromise is this. Hey, Michael, you want to write and direct a feature. You haven't done it. I'm going to tell you how to get there. You may not like it. You may not want to do it that way, but, but this is kind of the offer. This is the budget. We're going to probably have to bring in a director. You're not going to be able to bring in all your buddies. You're not going to be able to have every... But you're going to get a film made. So yeah, there is compromises made. You meet with them and you talk through that because ultimately someone's putting that money up. And at the end of that, they want their money back. So the business side really comes into that. So it's where artistic and creative meets the business side and finding that balance because we just can't fund everyone's passion project. Right. So do you prefer directing or EP? Gosh, whenever you do something for the first time, directing was so cool. And I say I directed 
my first, I mean, if you don't have a background for that, you surround yourself with a bunch of good people. People that are going to get you to the finish they line. They really yeah. help you. So, you know, did I direct? Yes, I did. But I, you know, I think a lot of people that know me well and were there would know that you just can't come from a finance business background and go jump on a film set and direct a feature. Um, I was fortunate that I had this script that I knew so well for 17 years and I was so involved in casting and a lot of it but I will, I know I will direct again. I just don't feel like I'm mature enough and experienced enough to do it. You know, you asked a question a minute ago about directing, writing, producing and being an, a, you know, an, an executive. One thing that happened under COVID that I was hoping didn't happen, being an executive producer also affords you the luxury of being on set. And I also, in addition to help with the contract and raising capital, I like that on set experience because mm -hmm. even though for some people outside of our industry, they're so excited to be on set. Most people don't realize how long and grueling those days are. It's <laughs> They're not fun. Very it's really, it's not fun. I say this, you have to have a passion for it. Yeah. You're getting up before most people get out of bed. You're on set. Mm -hmm. You're getting your day start. You're on your feet all day long and you're yeah. not leaving till the end of the day. Yeah. And even as an executive producer, when I was doing it, a lot of people said, I thought you'd be eating at a different table. I thought you'd be pulling up in a fancy car with a driver. I thought you, no, I want to get there early with the people because I wanted to learn about lighting. And mm -hmm. so I really hang out a lot on set with my directors. I'll go there and I'll hang out because I'm still learning and growing as a filmmaker. And a lot of that comes from, you know, you may be handled, but once we get on set, a lot of the contracts have been done. The negotiations have been done. You're making sure people get paid on time. You're making sure the wires are there. Mm -hmm. But at that point, you can kind of enjoy the process and then focus on distribution. So EP was almost a little bit of a way to buy myself to get on some of these sets and projects. To and get, get that up. knowledge base up from, from the... You, you yeah. clever son of a gun. <laughs> I, don't know about that. I don't But anyway, I do enjoy executive producing. It's my passion right now. I do want to go back and write and direct. I just don't feel like I'm equipped to do it yet. I think I need more experience. Okay. So I know the, a big question, anybody that's watching this, is how does Robert select the films he's going to be a part of in EP? And, and how, does, how does that... Because now you're moving into your fourth one that you can only talk about limited, but like going looking at five, films five, six, like how how does something get on your radar? How do you decide? Okay, this is something I want to put my time and effort into. I just take two sets of dice and I shake <laughs> them up and I throw them on the table and whatever. <laughs> um, it was much different with the first three, but the fourth one. Um, you know, if you can have it pre-sold and pre-packaged and have your money before you go into production, that to me sounds like the way to go. So going forward, what do you try to do? Um, if you can have a list talent um, that you can package it with, it opens the door to so many more conversations out of the gate because it sounds crazy. We all get caught up in our film and our story and we're going to wow someone. Every phone call, every meeting, every Zoom call, every project that comes up, they ask, what is the genre and who's in it? That's the first two things? They don't ask for the script. They don't care. They don't want to read. The, they want to know, is it horror, suspense, what is it, and who's in it, end of the conversation. If you can't answer those two things, more than likely they're going to exit the call pretty quickly because from the financial side, from distribution, and it's a shame because there's a lot of good quality independent films that eventually make their way there, but it's not the normal path. It's a very, very hard road to come out with an independent project with a no-name writer, a no-name director, and not a very big cast and hope that it's going to get seen and viewed by a lot of people. They occasionally make it there. We hear about them, but it's rare. But it's just such a shame because they have really have monetized our films. It's who's on the DVD cover. Right. Who is so? I think when I choose them, obviously I, I do have an investment group that I'm trying to get a return on their money. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I kind of answer to that. The only way that I can continue to do this and grow, I have to make money. Like right. I said, there's not, you know, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos from Amazon donating a hundred million dollars to say go out and support the arts and just make films. 
you have a select group of individuals that are putting up money and they want to see that money come back to them with the return. So you try to be selective on the genres, what they're buying, what people are viewing. The landscape is changing daily um, and it's just been so hard. Even coming out of COVID, it's changed in the last 12 months. So it's just so hard. And like I said, if I could tell you that anyone really knew what they were doing and knew for certain that a project would, would um, be a hit, they don't know, but what you try to do is make the best sound financial decision, mitigate risk, put an A-list talent in there, go with a genre that sells, and generally you can recoup 100 to 125% of your investment pretty quickly. It doesn't always work that way, but if monetized the correct, correct way in the business, there's a reason why these big studios continue to make these films, even after big flops. They're yeah. making lots of money. Is there a reason you didn't go the festival route with Full Count? You went directly into distribution. Because um, I know for the traditional filmmaker's path is I'm going to get either a short or feature made and I'm going to do the festival circuit so I can get uh, notoriety and recognize in the industry and hopefully you know that's something that sparks their career or launches their career you completely bypassed the festival well, stuff. Thank you. I think it was out of ignorance. But, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, at one time I had someone tell me, well, if you go the festival route and you've already screened it, you may limit some options because it's already been out and it's been, you know, the festival circuit. And again, the second film I did, um, The Devil to Pay, did go the festival route and it gave them great exposure. And it ultimately ended up in distribution. So I have done one that way. But it really, I think it was just out of ignorance. I didn't know. I got it completed and I thought the next thing to do was, you know, get a screener available and get your Vimeo link up and give them a password and send this out to 25 people and see if you get some bites. I was very fortunate that some people did, but I just don't know if I, you know, I knew what the festival route was. I've supported festivals big proponent, a tender of the Atlanta Film Festival here, so I knew about it. I just, I don't know why I didn't think that that may have been a, you know, a means um, for distribution, but people clearly do do it and are successful at it. And I've had films acquired after being seen in festivals, so it's definitely a pathway. Yeah. It's funny how you talk about winging it, because I definitely uh, winged this whole process of building a studio, because at no point did I ever see it. it You've done an amazing job. I, I followed your journey online, and I've been wanting to come down here forever, and I'm so happy for you. And what a great success story for you, your entire team in Atlanta. I mean, this is a big deal. It's a big deal. I guess, you know, it really is a big deal. It is. Uh, yeah. You've <laughs> it's, here. Yeah, it's, it's a it's, one-stop it's, shop. you got it all here. It is. I think ultimately what we try to do here is just have an environment where other creatives can from the moment they walk in, they feel inspired to create, regardless of what that looks like, whether it's uh, photography, music, podcast, whatever it is. We just like to really, this is going to go a little sidetracked, but I think you can relate, um, especially because you were talking about legacy. Um, a lot for, for the longest time at, in my adult life, I had this uh, anxiety around death, right? Because death is just very final right yeah. that's it right that's all she wrote so one of the things that um because obviously we can't live forever my my thing to push me forward is legacy meaning i can't live forever but i want to create something that does so you constantly or will always have a footprint that's left so i think that's where the storyteller in me kind of resonates like it's something that Many, many years after I'm gone, whatever, like that's still always there. You know, that's so. I love it. And <laughs> it's, you're living it. I can tell by meeting your team. I mean, the, the lives and the people you've impacted and touched and how many people you've launched into a career in various parts of the industry. So I'm glad to be here today. And this has been on my list for a while. And when you finally reached back out. I knew regardless of what I had today, I was going to make this. I, I had to make it. I had to, I had to make it. And I was like, and a lot of times too, when we talk about the passion projects, there's a lot of times where, um, like our podcast, I've really had to get everybody on the team to really push me to make sure that this happens because a lot of times we get so overloaded and our plate gets full with our client work. And it's just like, 
important things like this don't end up happening because we're just too busy. And I'm like, we, we, we have to one day a month do some bulk recording just so we can get it out there. Because I think information like this is the stuff that people can't Google or they can't YouTube it. And it's the information that so many people strive to, to get because there is that that whole business piece of film it's the the business side of it so it's 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 excellent that you're here as an open book because i can tell you i'm grateful to all no and i think that both of you guys when you guys talk about legacy just the films that you're making kind of being a trailblazer within being someone that i wrote and directed my own but now you're going into the ep route and michael you with the studio in terms of legacy and building stuff and one thing that I want to leave with is in terms of legacy. If there's something that you could give somebody, some secret sauce or some knowledge that you've learned along the way, because going from making your own films to EPing other people's films is a big jump. It's not easy to make that jump. But if there's anything that you could give to somebody inside your journey that you've experienced, any advice, what, what, what would that advice be? I would say that what I have learned and what I continue to be reminded of Film is a collaborative experience, and we all have been on sets before where egos get into play, whether it be a producer, a director, and i found in the few films that I've been involved with, the people that have taken pause and listened to either an actor or someone else's input about a line, a scene, in my experience, nine out of 10 times, the film ends up being better for it. So I've been on sets before where a writer or director is like, it's my way or the highway, read the line. And they're very hung up on that and they're not open to feedback or open to collaboration. And I think films suffer. So what I would say the secret sauce is we go forward in business, in life, um, and particularly on a film set. I had so many scenes in full count that were not part of my script that an actor felt empowered and comfortable enough to come to me on lunch break afterwards and say, hey Robert, if we have enough time tomorrow, would you care if we did this scene or read it this way? And I was like, absolutely. And two or three of the best scenes, the most memorable scenes, the scenes that people remember, that people emailed me about or remember, are all because I listened and believed in that actor or actress and someone. So what I would just say, it's so important. It is a creative process. We have to listen and it's not my way or the highway. And there's so many good, qualified, smart people that may have a little bit different take or vision. And what I say is if you have time, you're not running over budget, your day's not running over, shoot it, get into the editing room and make a decision. Mm -hmm. So if you have the time and it affords you, so that would be my one takeaway, is just my limited time, four films, this is a collaborative process. Ears open, listen. Gotcha. Well, we're going to have to let you go. We can't keep you prisoner any longer, bro. But I feel like based off of this conversation, we definitely have to have a part two. We yeah, we, we want to hear coming, about yeah. this film four when you're able to speak about it a little bit more and, and definitely get the, the secret sauce of that one because that sounds like it's, uh, it's, it's revving up to be probably one of the bigger things that accomplishment from an EP standpoint. Let's keep our fingers crossed that this Delta variant and COVID continue to. We've got good protocols, but we're hoping to go in in two weeks. But thank you. I've enjoyed my time here, and I'll definitely be back. It's been a pleasure. Excellent. So that will wrap up this episode of the Creative AF Podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you're joining us from YouTube or follow us on Spotify if that's where you're connecting. Also, make sure to leave your ideas for future episodes, comments, or people you'd like to have interviewed on this show. Uh, and until next time, ciao. Peace. Oh. Powered by M3 Creative.